Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. Episode 28 of the Women in Vinyl podcast. You just heard Hollow by Dance Loud off their album, The Movement. Thanks to Kristen and Desiree of Dance Loud, a Chicago-based house electronic music DJ and drummer duo for the use of their track. Today's guest is Carolyn King. Carolyn is a popular music academic, lecturer, and researcher who teaches all over the UK. She's led on modules such as artist development and PR, sound and culture, and popular music debates, with a special interest in rock and roll history. She is currently working on a PhD at the University of Birmingham, exploring the enduring format of vinyl. She is a regular panel speaker and conference presenter on all things vinyl. If you're like us, you've often wondered why there is such a different collector culture between men and women when it comes to vinyl. Carolyn's chapter in the Rutledge Handbook of Women's Work in Music really breaks down the reasons this may be, citing an unconscious bias and the ways of dealing with stereotype threat, including psychological or physical avoidance where women will distance themselves from environments or situations where this threat may be experienced, and what discourages women from audio technology, record stores and DJ culture, and reinforces minority status. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for asking me. Um, and thank you for doing Women in Vinyl. It's about time, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you great. are definitely one of us. And, you know, after we spoke and um, you sent the chapter, we were like, we have to have her on. Oh, uh, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're going to open a lot of people's eyes to things that maybe some of our guests are a little bit afraid to talk about. Okay. Um, and you've actually done the research as to yeah. why some gender bias exists. Um, and so before we get, get into all of that, could you tell our listeners a little bit about you, what you do, and about your podcast as well? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Carolyn King, um, and I am a freelance popular music lecturer. I teach all over the UK. I teach everything from music business to the cultural sociology of music. And I am just finishing a PhD on vinyl records and the resurgence of vinyl in the digital era and how that's also a kind of fake word. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, the focus has really become on the kind of the lack of diversity within the vinyl consumer. And yeah, that was published in a chapter by Routledge just recently with loads of other great women and their work as well. And my I present and host... Um, the Songs Are Spells podcast, which is a fusion of music, generally artists or people in the music industry and ideas around magic, because I feel like the two are so combined and we just don't always notice it. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it's quite blatant. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did you find your way was it while you were doing your PhD that you realized about the gendering issue or was it before that? So I'd always been somewhat conscious of it, but I think that like a lot of things, we just kind of accept them and it's just the way it is. And especially in the music industry, there is like a code of conduct. There's, the whole sort of reciprocal thing where you know you scratch my back I'll scratch yours so if I wanted to work with someone I had to honor their values and their beliefs and always at the back of my mind was the idea that I'm 
you know, a working class woman from Glasgow and what does this mean in this, you know, how do I relay this? But we're just not conscious of it. It's not at the forefront of our minds and that's what I wanted to do with the research. But I didn't know that at the start when I applied. I thought I just wanted to look at why records were popular again, um, why they were being sold in like lifestyle stores and supermarkets. Um, yeah, and that became the sort of boring part, to be honest. Like, they're, they're, you know, the fact the fact of the matter is they've always been popular with different markets, and there, yeah, there's definitely a kind of hipster element to it, um, and it's also bringing more younger people into it as well, which is good. But the gendering was something that I also noticed in, you know, for example, lifestyle stores like Urban Outfitters on the specific floors, like for men and for women, they would have certain records that they wouldn't have on other floors and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah, so then I was like, oh, because the whole point, and my supervisor kept saying, you know, you really want to say something new. What can you say that's new about this? So that was part of the reason I wanted to delve into it as well, was not just to write a really good original PhD, but was to actually open up the conversation and bring light to people because Vinyl's not going anywhere. Right. If anything, it's growing, right? So let's hope um, so. I would still like to have a job. <laughs> 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 I mean, but that's but that's exactly it though. You're not just like shining light on it, but you're actually like speaking truth to this thing that we know. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like the, the Harry Potter kind of analogy <laughs> where it's like the guy that must not be named. And you're like, don't talk about dudes being dicks. They don't know. And if we don't tell them, they won't know. But yeah. we know. And we know how terrible it is. But nobody wants to be like, hey, excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Because we don't want that put back on us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the backlash. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that, that's very much like why we were super excited to talk to you about it. Because we've all had a negative interaction mm -hmm. and nobody wants to especially especially people that are employed in vinyl right now like nobody wants to be like oh yeah yesterday at, at blah this happened and it was really <laughs> terrible and it made me feel like blah because they're worried about retaliation they're yeah. worried about being like the loud mouth bitch you know and like having this whole like blowback mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that you're actually doing research and you're like yeah it's not just a figment of your beep beep imagination it's a very real thing and now you can study it yeah yeah right. it's awesome so i mean it's chef's kiss <laughs> and yeah and you know we all read the chapter and so we have some things that we're sort of pulling out that we want to yeah. dive into with you okay oh, cool. yeah so yeah. the first quote of the chapter says you would think with women being more suited to the home life they would actually be more into record collecting than men and the ideology by being that men are serious when it comes to vinyl technology and women are not. So mm -hmm. this is crazy to me because I often get asked why, like, I, well, I guess I've just never understood why it's weird for women to be collectors of things. You know, I mean, yeah. when we're kids, maybe they collected Barbies if we're going to be stereotypical right now, yeah. you know? So it's like, why is that so strange? Um, when it comes to something like records. And so you sort of, well, you did dive into that. Um, so where did that stem from? So, yeah, so I had to start by reading all of the literature. <laughs> so, yeah, when did that part start? Uh, because I know I had to read the chapter like three times to get my like basic brain around it, where I was like, oh, okay, expand that concept. Okay. And like, look at other things and look up words, because that's a thing for me too. Um, but like, how long did it take you to do the research to, to get into that part where you were like informed to write that? I mean, that would have been around two to three years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, sorry to interject there, but yeah, so you said you were reading all of the literature and where did it come from? Yeah, and so my supervisor said, so you need to look at sound studies, you need to look at collector studies and just gave me the kind of key words to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I started to look at collector studies and again, there's not much written on it. There's really not much, but... What it does say is that collecting is gendered and there's higher value attributed to 
as something that's technological and typically that would be in the masculine domain and that you know really transpires in music in terms of like the studio environment and engineering and production and all these and I guess other STEM subjects we call them Mm -hmm. that's still very much a thing Um, and it was considered that a lot of collectors who are men are quite sort of geeky or maybe even like neurodiverse as well now Mm -hmm. um in that they would obsess (laughs) and it would be something like a cause of anxiety if they didn't have the full collection and i guess we (laughs) see that in movies like high fidelity right we Mm -hmm. see that i see it when i look in the mirror come on (laughs) (laughs) yeah this is the thing um and then pe- people have also tried to say that like neurodiversity is much more of a masculine thing as well. I, I-, I believe that the-, the figures say that it had been, but that's all down to like diagnosis and coming forward and actually voice in it as well. So, so this- the data is not entirely clear. Um, but yeah, it's typically been serious collectorships being attributed to men, and that's definitely the case with records. But that's crazy because women back in the kind of post-war women would have been the ones choosing the phonograph and selecting the records but for different reasons it was typically to make the home look good so we're back to this aesthetic element which is different to the technology element did you find in your research that women were using them then too if they were selecting the objects yeah yeah that is certainly the case and even in like women's magazines like cosmopolitan and stuff like that they were saying, yeah, buy this one, this is good, this sounds better, and stuff like that. So, yeah, they were definitely using them. Um, but the marketing was much more at how does it look and um, a little bit on how it sounds and will it be okay in the home? Will it, you know, disturb the ambience? And will I be able to use it to educate my children as well? Yeah, I think it was interesting because at some point in the article, and it may have been later in time, you were talking about the same sort of thing with this, what almost sounded like women influencers um, in magazines and stuff. I thought that was so interesting because it's like almost how people are marketing again today in some cases, you know, through Instagram and and finding women to market in particular. Yeah. Yeah, so, So back then the magazines would just have been targeting them. And then I guess it would have been word of mouth. So the woman next door to me has this turntable, maybe I'll get that. And it's, yeah, and things like that. So the the age old, I guess influence is not a new thing, but we just right. use that word, don't we? Like the Instagram influencer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that would have been the, the equivalent back then, kind of post-war, yeah, yeah. post-World War Two. yeah. Because would they have to go in, like, there was like a showroom kind of scenario where they would have to go and pick out their cabinet too, right? Like it wasn't like a... Oh yeah. Thing where yeah, like, there was no yeah. Amazon. <laughs> I'll, I'll take uh, cabinet number six five four three. Thanks, and then they would show up at their door because they yeah. actually had to go do the thing. So totally, and it's so funny because even now that kind of going to a shop, listening to all the examples, talking to the salespeople, that still holds more value in phonograph technology land than maybe in other, you know, like buying clothes online or whatever. Um, That holds much more value still. And I I looked at that in a shop in Glasgow called Loud and Clear Glasgow. Shout out to them. (laughs) (laughs) They are a really, really good sort of high-end audio store. And you don't just pop in, you know, and buy something quickly. You go in for like a day. (laughs) You sit and they have like a fake living room and all that. And you can sit and imagine that it's your listening room at home and wow yeah it's incredible how was that interaction when you went in there were there kind of gender aspersions that they cast on you for like oh lady you walked into the wrong store get out (laughs) you don't belong in here (laughs) ma'am yeah so I would feel like there's always a bit of that yeah yeah so they kind of look at you like um why you here also, they didn't really know me at that point. And then I attended like a listening event in the store. And the it was something like six men plus one man who had brought a woman who I'm assuming was a partner. 
and then me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and what I noticed was that when people were asking questions and things like that, it was always the men. It was, and it was the men saying, "I can hear it. I can hear the difference. This is good. This mm. is bad." And this woman was just kind of sat there as if she was, you know, yeah, she didn't really yeah. have a voice at all. Um, and then there was me at the back asking kind of awkward questions because I'm like the sort of Louis Theroux in the room. Yes! <laughs> yeah, and I was just kind of there. <laughs> but it, it definitely threw some people in, and you could see some of the participants sort of looking at me as if, what? <laughs> Mm -hmm. can you give us an example of an awkward question that you asked um it would be things like um you know how do you how do you know that this is this is better when you've been here you know 10 minutes wouldn't you need like your you know your home system to make that comparison just things like that which i didn't think was rude or anything I, th I thought it was a legitimate research question um but <laughs> You know, in hindsight, yeah. now, that definitely would have came across <laughs> as a bit rude because they didn't really know who I was or what I was doing. Well, and that's not the kind of thing that they would expect because, again, sort of bringing back to the chapter is this thought of what you called an invisible knapsack or an yeah. apparent privilege. So, mm -hmm. so what does that mean and how would people identify the fact that they're maybe projecting that? Yeah, so that's Peggy McIntosh. Um, the, the privilege that we have that we don't, we're not even aware of until someone literally shoves it in her face. <laughs> yeah. So um, the fact that men can walk into a record store and not be judged um, and maybe be judged as knowledgeable in a positive light, that's their, that's their privilege. And to them, it's, it's an invisible knapsack of privilege. And it's something that they've never questioned. And what really proves that is the research when I did interview men and they were like, we don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean there's a gender bias? No. Um, the fact that they're so unaware of like women's experience in the record store shows that it's just something that's never crossed their mind. So it's an unconscious form of privilege. Even to the point that you were just making though, I think like if a guy had asked that question, he probably would not have gotten a strange look. It's like, you know, prove mm -hmm. to me why this is better here. Yeah, um, but when yeah. you asked it, you're like, uh, this might be an awkward question. And I think that's sort of something that we as women do. I find a lot of times if I'm following up with someone, I'll say, I'm just checking in. And I've had to consciously be like, remove just check in, you know, and so there's no yeah. reason for me to tiptoe or apologize around doing something like that. But I think your example of, mm -hmm. you know, being in the store and asking that question is a good, you know, it, it proves that point in a way yeah and I had to really sort of shout to be heard as well mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah and it could it felt quite uncomfortable um at times but like you say it's, it's pushing through that apologetic stance that you know because I have as much right to be there as them so I mean even more so because of it coming from like a research educational perspective where you have more than a legitimate reason to be there and ask these questions so. well what's so funny about that is that when those people and as soon as i walk into a store as well people automatically so i present you know as quite a, a feminized woman you know um yeah i would go in with like the red lipstick and at the time <laughs> the long blonde hair and all that and yeah. also people think i'm younger than i am as well and, you know, I have quite a high vibe. I'm very, like, positive. Um, and if they're used to kind of grey men going in, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who kind of hate their life and everyone else, you know, I'm straight away, I'm an anomaly. And um, that impacts how they respond. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how it translates to so many different fields, you know. But I think, you know, I mean, even my sister has talked about that if she doesn't, if she finishes a sentence with a period, she might be, you know, looked at as being curt or something versus, you know, just not an exclamation point. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with vinyl, we have the added collector thing on top of the, the business aspect. So, and then we, it's all encompassing with STEM, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So 
and that's science, technology, engineering, and math for anyone that doesn't know that at this point. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's sort of all encompassing all of those different things. Um, and you mentioned an internalized patriarchal privilege in the chapter yeah. as well and the encompass encompassing privilege and gender capital theories. Can you break those down for everyone so that they can kind of yeah sure so the whole idea of capital is like currency and it's it's not just you know monetary currency it can be like we said at the start the idea that you kind of have to network and keep people sweet in the music industry so that's very much like social capital who you know your network and then you have like cultural capital which is you know how much you know your skills what you can offer what kind of level you're at, that that kind of thing. And gender capital is, certainly in this industry, is the fact that men do wield more power and find it easier. Um, and in most industries, um, <laughs> compared to, let's say, women or maybe um, non-binary people as well. And yet yeah, internalised patriarchal capital is just taking that a step further. And it's taken the, the idea of like the invisible knapsack and translating it into just another form of currency. And you do see it. So you see men being sort of slipped like the, the rare issues and stuff like that under the counter. And, you know, you do see them being booked for more shows and um, just the lack of awareness around it that's what i mean by internalized patriarchal capital but the fact that they keep using it to get ahead means that it's currency for them and they'll keep doing it yeah it's interesting yeah i think there's sort of that on the flip side the imposter syndrome for a lot of us i know yeah like for for me part of the reason why when i first started women in vinyl i didn't want to be part of documentaries or lectures or honestly even a podcast was because of that. I didn't feel confident in what I know, even though I know it backwards and forwards. I talk about it every single day. But that's that was sort of the issue for me was was that comfort level of people being like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She hasn't been doing this for 20 years. Definitely. That doesn't mean that I haven't been touching records and playing records for 20 years. I just yeah. haven't been in the industry that long pressing records because it wasn't a thing that mm -hmm. I even knew existed. So I think that that is really interesting on the flip side to think about too and how we hold ourselves back potentially in some cases definitely so that's the whole Sheryl Sandberg thing isn't it from Facebook um the whole idea of leaning in even if you feel like an imposter lean in anyway yeah. <laughs> ask the awkward questions <laughs> be like Louis Theroux mm -hmm. um because that's the only way of, of addressing the balance right and I guess we're all doing that we're all doing that like a hundredfold <laughs> like with what we do yeah um so hopefully that will help other people to maybe consider doing it and taking that first step right i guess we we need to cultivate some like internalized capital then we need to cultivate that in, mm -hmm. in ourselves um because i get like that as well so when, when people ask me what to do sometimes i kind of maybe underplay it a little bit and it's only when you know i talk to women like you that i'm like oh, wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> And do you feel like it's because we just are so used to it that we just kind of are like, oh, well, that's the way that it is. So it's, there's no use talking about it because that's, it's always going to be like that. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, I don't, I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to, yeah. like some people use this term battle fatigue. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to have to justify it. You know, if a guy's like, what you do this, you, you cut records. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and they'll be like, really? And they'll question yeah. it. And they'll right. be like, for how long? Where? <laughs> totally. <Yeah. laughs> um, and it does become fatiguing. It's it's battle fatigue. It's yeah. yeah. And I'd rather not deal with that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I feel like that that's the thing. Like they're starting. There's like pockets of them, but they're they're starting to come along. Yeah, we've got a lot of support for sure from yeah, men with women yeah. in That's battle. great to hear. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think that's been you know one of the things that's great about having you here is again that we there's some sort of research behind it because I feel like a lot of times if we had had this episode if like Robin and I had just had it or our board had just had it it mm -hmm. would be it could come across I guess as like a bitch fest yeah. and yeah that but 
but it's true you know we're not making, <laughs> making this stuff up it goes all the way back in time so i think that's really yeah. interesting to back it up with something um yeah yeah at the end of the day we're not trying to hate on anyone right. um but we're talking yeah we're talking about like factual academic research that has shown that there is a divide and mm -hmm. it's, it all boils down to exhibition of knowledge knowledge really and the way that we have to prove ourselves and it's not just as women it would be for people who don't have a gender identity and and also we see it a lot in minority um, people of color for example right um i was in a lecture the other day um about race ethnicity and the music industries and i had a guest lecturer in the wonderful jay chambers who is always on bbc news um, he's great he's a dub poet and an activist and he got the people of color in the room talking about this not that they have to but they chose to and they said i have to fight twice as hard as my white equivalent um so yeah this is intersectional um i wasn't able to go that far and do the intersectional analysis of it but i really really hope someone does yeah that was one of the questions that i had actually was like if you saw a difference for women versus the lgbtq plus community and minority communities in this bias i mean so i only met one woman of color in the whole time i was going into record shops whoa yeah and that was in brixton in london and she was the owner whoa yeah what's her she... shop called so we can get some butts in her record store totally it's called pure vinyl pure vinyl okay yeah and i feel like she had a little bit of battle fatigue like she didn't really want to go there to be honest she just wanted to get on with running her business um, <laughs> and that's totally understandable um but yeah that that is true i only ever met one woman of color in the whole the whole research that i did i was of course trying to get as, as diverse a sample as possible yeah. but um that was all i saw in my observations so there's yeah there's absolutely an intersectional divide there and I, yeah, I really want someone to come along and further research that because, again, it's just been accepted. Right. That's shocking. Yeah. I can't find women in certain fields in this industry to diversify things as much as I would like to. Um, and one of the points is that we want to do that um, in this project that we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, but they just don't exist in some cases. And so... Um, if anyone out there is listening and yeah. knows of, you know, more diverse communities within cutting and plating and pressing, I mean, please let us know. Cause I worry sometimes that it will appear a certain way if, you know, there's only diversity within like DJing, for example, or yeah. record stores, there's other opportunities out there too. So, mm. yeah. That is really interesting if we could do a kind of census of that mm -hmm. if people were willing to yeah to say i'm yeah i'm here i'm doing yeah. it um but i've been kind of erased from the narrative right i guess the famous example of that would be the doctor who theme mm -hmm. mm. yeah and delia delia derbyshire who was put down as like maybe a studio assistant or something but actually she composed and engineered it. <laughs> she did the whole damn thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's still used today it's been obviously tweaked and everything but um that's her work yeah um but pre-world war ii it was kind of perceived that vinyl was gender neutral but i mean it wasn't but why do you think that there was like a perception that it was like oh records are for everybody yeah so so that was from looking at um things like the printed press and adverts and stuff like that and it, yeah, it seemed that it was aimed at everyone, really. Right. Um, but it was it was the the use of electronics in the Second World War and the tinkering with technology and the training that people, predominantly men, got during that time. And for them then to come back and take that on as a hobby or a right. specialism, an expertise was really what started to cause this divide and then that filtered into advertising and print media and I mean there's some horrendous 
adverts, you know, things like cartoons of men sort of trying to go into a record shop where there's a woman dragging her man into a shoe shop and stuff like that. One of those um, memes is what started Women Vinyl. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, there was the one, it was a guy who's holding a record and his wife is knitting and oh my God. <laughs> and he's trying to like nerd out with her about <clears throat> the pressing that he's holding and she is basically like I could care less and every single person I swear every single person on Instagram reposted this thing talking about their wives oh and God. I kept commenting like get a woman that can do both <laughs> like it was making me <laughs> crazy so yeah it, it spawned this like look into um all of the women that were doing really cool things and and leading labels and pressing plants and all of this stuff and not getting the same kind of recognition that the fact that people would post that and think it was okay it wasn't and so yeah that's sort of what spawned the whole thing <laughs> yeah I mean I mean that wasn't even a meme back then that was real that was a right. real advert um and it was just accepted again it goes back to this idea of we just accept things yeah. so people accepted that and and then it filters into language stuff like sound man and hi-fi man and all this yeah <laughs> what are some of the most interesting long-lasting trends that you found um i was happy that in your extensive research i connected the dots before i saw crosley <laughs> i was like oh <laughs> and then a couple sentences later i was like oh hey <laughs> But and totally. and, mm -hmm. and no disrespect or shade on Crosley, but it is very interesting in their the way that they market. Um, so what did you find with that? Yeah, I mean they definitely have their place. They they've brought a lot of like children into vinyl, which is fantastic. And they're like sort of entry level first record player. There's nothing wrong with that. But um oh, we celebrate yeah. that here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I certainly know people who would like turn their nose up at that um <laughs> but that's not cool because that's that's not what we're trying to achieve but um what Crosley have done is is they've taken one of the longer standing embedded ideas that women only buy vinyl record players or turntables if they look good yeah mm -hmm. and the whole sort of pastel colors particularly the pink one was all over Instagram it's very Instagrammable it's yeah it's aesthetic it's all about the aesthetic um and then people start to criticize and say these aren't real record players they'll ruin your records blah 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 blah. this is all just about the look um but you could argue that all facets of life are now that because let's face it we live oh, yeah. in instagram land mm -hmm. you kind of have to appreciate their market analysis to understand the buying power of women and female identifying people mm -hmm. that are, you know, maybe a little bit more concerned with aesthetics, that's fine, but that they've empowered that buying sector to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get a turntable. This is cool. But did you, did you see that in the research at all, where it was like very targeted towards like the buying potential of women and women identifying people and how they were trying to like encapsulate or, use <laughs> that to their yeah. advantage totally yeah and I mean it's it's kind of smart in many ways um and yeah lots of women did buy those pink turntables and that's fine they do look good but um I guess the issue is that it's it's then reinforcing a kind of stereotype that that's all women want and that's the only way that they'll engage with audio technology is if it looks good in the living room or whatever mm -hmm. um so that's where the issue lies and there is like a parallel story with um the gibson guitars um the, the daisy one... rock yeah uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> daisy rock as well um so i think it was gibson that um, brought out the the goddess guitar right. and it was like a smaller guitar and it was aimed specifically at at women who they felt would always be smaller um than their main guitarists counterparts um i mean again it's just reinforcing the stereotype that women can only access this field if they have women-shaped kit right. and that's just not true 
Right. But we're at such an interesting time and really like my students have taught me so much about this recently, this idea that maybe these sort of gendered ideas are out of date now. Yeah. Maybe, you know, we're old fashioned now. <laughs> and um, in 10 years time, it's just not going to be a thing. Like gender is just not a thing. And the idea that sort of fluidity um, and stereotypes will be seen as this really sort of dinosaur idea. That's what I'm starting to see in my students. And it's actually really exciting. Yeah. On that note, um, I think that that's a really good segue. One of our last questions, which was, how do you think that as a community, we can begin to break the gender bias? Like, what do you think we Mm. could do to break it down and make people aware? Because I think that's the biggest first step is what are you doing that's causing this and how can you be better? Yeah. So as a community, I would say offering a safe space for people to report when maybe they have been treated badly in a record store. Because that immediately takes away this assumption that it's just the way it is and that we just have to tolerate it. So having a place where they could come and say, this happened, this wasn't okay, what do you think? And actually see it from another point of view, I think is is great. And you already do that, so yeah. <laughs> um, visibility, so the fact that your platform is so visible and also really, really popular as well. Like, this is not a minority <laughs> group. This is, you know, this isn't some really, like, obscure thing. It's really popular. And that just shows that women have been that desperate for a, a, an outlet and a platform like this. Um, educating staff in places like record shops and any sort of record-based place. Um, educating them that at the end of the day actually a record store owner said this to me he said at the end of the day customers are paying our wages so why would we be discriminatory why would we be weird with them hold that thought it's time for an amanda fact the first live performance recording was made on may 31st 1926 at the royal opera house at covent gardens in central london and it was all made possible thanks to the improvements in the recording process to the sound collection innovated during the electric era. Before now, you just could not capture details in live recording. So the first ever live album, what was it, you might ask? It was an opera, go figure. An Italian opera, actually, performed by a Russian singer in central London. That night, they were captured nine sides of recorded material. Ultimately, four sides were successfully enough recorded to be mass produced and released. The opera was actually, uh, I'm going to butcher the name of this, so you'll have to, um, I don't know, forgive me. Uh, It's called Mistofile, and it's a story about Faust's deal with the devil, and that is very rock and roll. You all know by now that Robin and I are on opposite ends of the record organizational spectrum. But one thing we do agree on, how fantastic Keppel Design's record dividers and record blocks are. Beautifully handcrafted by expert craftswomen in San Francisco, Keppel dividers are sleek, sophisticated, customizable, and built to last. No matter how you organize, Keppel are the dividers to use. Get $10 off your first order of $85 or more using code women in vinyl at checkout www.keppeldesign.com that's k o e p p e l design.com and now back to the episode what about to that instagram community that can tend to objectify like what would you say to the community as a whole as far as Um, being better at allowing women the space to um, not only present their records however they would like, but also in commenting and like your response to that. How can people be more open to these types of conversations on social media where people are sharing music Mm -hmm. and approach it from a place where they're not putting out 
um, the, the invisible knapsack or privilege. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, wow. So I guess this again comes down to education. So calling it out people who try and, you know, troll you, um, calling that out, actually calling it out publicly. I've seen a lot of people rather than just sort of block someone they've actually like shared the post and been like look what i got yeah. and really just publicly calling this out because this is the other power that comes with the social media is that we can do that <laughs> like yeah we can post uh, pictures with our records but we can also call out people who try and shit on that yeah right <laughs> so it works yeah there's multiple ways that that it works so i would certainly advocate for that <laughs> And then block them probably as well. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Because again, it's about protecting your spe your your peace and your energetic space, which is so important now more than ever. Yeah, I think that's the message that maybe I would put out there is that like, don't assume that the person who's posting doesn't know and think about it before you comment. Maybe mm -hmm. you could reframe it in a way that's starting a conversation versus explaining to the person something that they may already know. Yeah. I mean, Maybe. or just let people live their lives. Don't comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like it or move along. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So just protect your peace in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, were there any other similar threads in gender bias that you uncovered while you were researching the chapter? Like, with record stores, with any other kind of examples? Um, I guess another one that really stands out would be the, um, th that when women are working there as staff, mm -hmm. and there was an interesting incident when a woman chose to sort of distance herself from any chat around gender in the record store. Could be battle fatigue, um, could be um, that she just doesn't identify a problem potentially that's great if she doesn't but um yeah i did see that that some women were reluctant to engage in the conversation but they were always women that were in a store where a man had openly said there's not an issue hmm. really interesting yeah that is so very can you take us through like how that would go down like when you went into a record store like what was your interaction like when you were like hey i'm here on research like <laughs> yeah they, like this isn't a yeah. bookstore lady like, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're in the wrong place <laughs> yeah um so again i would go in i would be like really kind of upbeat also you know i wasn't always researching in scotland it was it was uk wide so they would hear my accent and make judgments on that as well <laughs> and yeah this is People it from scotland um, can enjoy music yeah apparently <laughs> so um yeah and as soon as i said you know i'm i'm doing a phd at university of birmingham you know a russell group university um, I'm looking at records and what they mean today. Would you be have five minutes? A lot of people would be like, yeah, of course, fantastic. You know, this is my area, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then occasionally, yeah, some people would be like, oh, we're so bored of this. There's no resurgence. <laughs> leave us alone. Yeah, just what? leave us be, yeah. <laughs> or that I was maybe sort of sensationalizing it a bit, which I wasn't at all. Um, yeah, and then those little, or, or I would maybe say something like well, i'm quite interested in you know what kind of customers you get how diverse is your customer base um who's your typical customer and they would always say well it's usually just local white men um yeah and i'd be like why do you think that is and they would say well it's just a man's thing isn't it <laughs> and then the women would sort of disappear into the back <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i guess there's loads of ways you could interpret that in that they don't want to get into it. They don't want to bring attention to it. They don't want to address it or they just don't care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Well, that kind of, I mean, that brings up another kind of maybe question for me where do you think it's because of like the pay gap and mm. the accessibility of discretionary income mm -hmm. for white men of, 
know, varied educational backgrounds or whatever that are making more money. So they've had more access to technology and yeah, well, that's certainly what the data um, on things like the pay gap would suggest, yeah. is that they, typically they will have more disposable income, um, and records are not cheap, you know, mm-hmm. so, as you know well. So, um, yeah, it is, it is more of a luxury item, it is, right. it is. And that's absolutely a factor in terms of accessibility, income level, definitely. Yeah. Um, a lot of my students that I, I would do focus groups with my students, they would say, we would absolutely buy more records, but we just can't afford them. Mm-hmm. Well, that's when you tell them to go to a good used shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, how how epic is your collection? It's really diverse. So um, I really like to collect a lot of 90s hip hop. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've also got all the classics, you know, all the rumours or different Beatles records or whatever. Mm. Um, a student actually gave me a record, her own record that she'd made. Um, and she'd sort of got it pressed and distributed it herself, nice. which is fantastic. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah, she's like 19 and she went and did that herself. And um, I thought that was really cool. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole mix of things like that, things people have given me, a lot of hip hop, um, old rock, some random Scottish indie, and a lot of Johnny Cash as well. (laughs) Nice. Well, with this talk of collections, we have a question that we ask as our final question to our guests, which is, um, if you could create a seven inch record with anything on the A side and anything on the B side, what would you make? Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) So I recently did something similar. It was a playlist of 10 songs um, and they had to be in the order that they appeared on the original album. Interesting. So I'm going to pick some stuff from that. (laughs) That's totally fine. Yeah, so I guess I would go for, yeah, the first track on that, which was um, Most Deaf and it was Fear Not Of Man. Cool. I mean, that's also mm-hmm. relevant for the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like that's, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I think, yeah, I would go, that's just such a great album opener. And actually the first time I even heard that album was on a record that my friend played in a pub in Glasgow. So um, yeah, so that's just a fantastic opening to an album. It's all about um, where are we at? And I mean, this was like the early 90s and he's saying like, this is where we're at now. A lot of things are changing. A lot of things are coming. But um, Mind Over Matter, Soul Before Flesh is like the line in it. So it's nice. like, um, be, yeah, basically like go inward and don't be, yeah, don't be, don't let people bring your vibe down. And yeah, so much so relevance perfect. from that whole album. Yeah, like, that's a good one. That, I feel like yeah. that's the song that you got to play when you walk in to do your lectures now. Yeah. Oh my god! You're... It's like your hype, your hype song. You're just like, all right, kids, got her I'm gonna drop box. some knowledge. On. <laughs> Get ready. I've just um, visualized that perfectly. <laughs> I love it. We're gonna get you on. We're we're gonna book you a TED talk. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, I just love that. Um, and I guess like for a B side, did you say for a B side as well? Yeah, um, yeah. It would be. Um, what was the other yeah i'm gonna go there i'm gonna go with the prodigy yes (laughs) awesome um i think the song i picked was breathe on that playlist so yeah um i'm gonna go for breathe because prodigy were yeah the first festival band that i saw Mm -hmm. when i think i was only 16 and i ran off to the leeds festival to see um, the prodigy and Guns N' Roses. I just, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> now we're I just, talking. Uh, I just rebought that record, the prodigy. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. They so reissued good. it, and I was like, I need this. <laughs> oh my god, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually anything by the prodigy, but yeah, I would go with Breathe. Nice. And I just remember it being like just spectacular and just like genre bending and just unbelievable and i can't say i've ever seen a show that's been like it ever since yeah it was so cool while. yeah yeah so that would be my picks <laughs> cool 
Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. This was great. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. It's been amazing. So it kind of feels like we're in the same room. <laughs> when we make it over to the UK, we will be. It yeah. will be great. So all going well, I'll be in the US at the end of June. Oh, oh nice. For what? Yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's the hype machine. Tell us all the things that you're into. <laughs> give us, give us the, the, the notes, the places that people can find you and follow you. Not in a creepy way, but in the best possible way. <laughs> to support you and get into your uh, research and... Um, yeah so hopefully hopefully i'll be doing a little bit of chat panel chat at the the making vinyl conference oh great oh i know that they're still very much deciding what what how it's going to look but hopefully yeah Amazing. i can be discussing this research there um i haven't booked like my trip yet or anything um my plan was to come over and go to nashville for like a week and then go to memphis for maybe the final week nice. um yeah um but i guess i'm kind of holding off to see is everything <laughs> like it's just the world we live in right um yeah everything's a little bit tumultuous so um yeah but yeah i would really really hope that goes ahead and yeah people can follow me on instagram at carolyn l king l for louise and um Oh yeah, the podcast is the, at the Songs or Spells podcast and hopefully Jen's episode will be with you very soon. <laughs> and yeah, what, what other else do I have? Twitter as well, that's Carolyn L. King, but mainly Instagram just because. Awesome. Oh yeah, and the podcast has a TikTok at Songs or Spells podcast as well. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Time. That was awesome. Yeah. Have a great rest of your evening. <laughs> you too, when it, when it comes. <laughs> well, take care. We'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thanks for joining us on the Women in Vinyl podcast. You can join our ever-growing list of sponsors, other record labels, Selector, Couple Design, Eargasm, Groove Washer, Glowtronics, New Gen Audio, and bow, 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 bow. Vinyl Revolution Record Show. And thanks for sponsoring the show. Um, hey, as always, you can join our conversation on Instagram or send us a note at media at womeninvinyl.com. Clock us. Send us info. If you have a question, yo, we got the answer. Or we'll find it. We won't lie to you. And check out womeninvinyl.com for past episodes the store, the job board, and the library of resources. Don't forget to like and subscribe and give us a review on your favorite podcast delivery method. You can also contribute to furthering our mission at patreon.com slash women in vinyl. Hey, guess what? This episode, 45 minutes. You know there was more. You want more? You get more. Go to patreon.com and you can get more. And you'll find all the B-sides, the deep cuts, and the amazing extras, including longer episodes, and contribute to the creation of scholarships and educational opportunities to further the demystification, the infiltration of more women and non-binary identifying humans into the vinyl making space, decreasing those turnaround times every week. Yeah, we love your records. We want you to love them too. Womeninvinyl.com. This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl and Red Spade Records. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.